You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Be cautious. Um, never assume that everything is okay. This is not a job for predisposed attitudes about people or about the job. And it's the unknown, um, I think, that adds the stress. If safety's important to you, it's not going to happen on its own. How we carry ourselves is the key to our safety and achieving our goals. That focus is probably the most important part of personal safety. Our goal should be to, to help the defendant and to go home safely at the end of the day. Someone once said that um, your best tool or defensive tactic is, is your mouth and your mind. You're just doing reports and writing and maybe you don't have anyone coming in right away. And, and you have a certain comfort level and your mind gets distracted by other things you have to get done that day. So, and I know I'm very guilty about this, you just forget that even in your office it could be, you could have an incident and that something could happen to you. Just because someone passes through the metal detector and has no weapons on them does not mean that they cannot be a threat. You know, their size doesn't even matter. They could be a small person and still be a danger to someone. So I, I do a visual of the clients when they come in and if I see something there that, that bothers me or is a, a red flag, I pass that information on to the officer before they come out. Can we predict what someone is going to do? I think we do the best we can based on the information that we have and I've learned to make decisions based on that information and leave it at that. Each offender you're working with is different and I think you need to know when to back off or when to be assertive and I think often if you come on too strong authoritarian with certain ones yeah, you could aggravate the situation. It's important to have procedures established ahead of time so that in the event of an emergency or an in-house arrest that the co-workers know where to go and what to do so no one gets hurt. There may be a pre-sentence report in the file, there may be a number of police reports, psychological, psychiatric, it doesn't matter. There's always going to be something about that individual that's not on paper. I don't think it's possible to put a person on paper. It's only what they've shown, and all you know is what they've shown. It's the unknown that presents a challenge and danger, the unknown. Live from the Federal Judiciary Studios in Washington, D.C., the Federal Judicial Center presents Safety Series, Office Scenarios. Moderating today's program, Mark Maggio. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today's program is the third in our safety series. Recall that the first broadcast we did addressed the topic of mindset uh, to sort of set the stage and emphasize how important that concept is across the board when you talk about officer safety. Uh, next, we, we addressed field scenarios back in May with our second broadcast, and today we're moving the discussion into the office. It's an area where when we talk to people in the field, a lot of them say, yeah, you feel pretty safe uh, working in the office. So we've got some vignettes we're going to show you today that were taken uh, from reports of hazardous incidents that uh, came in from the field. Uh, we've based the uh, videos you're going to see on those actual events that occurred. So uh, again, what you'll see are based on events that have actually happened in your system and not something that we just sort of drummed up on our own. Uh, they're real, real life events and uh, hopefully I think you'll find them uh, rather thought provoking and uh, good fodder for discussion. Now, as I said, uh, we're dealing with office uh, scenarios today and that inevitably draws into the discussion, the population in the probation pretrial office uh, of administrative staff. And to sort of boost uh, that, that part of our discussion, we, we did invite uh, someone we consider to be one of our nationally recognized members uh, on the admin side of probation pretrial. And I'll uh, introduce Rhonda as well as the other panelists in a few minutes. Um, as always, today's program uh, comes as a result of working with the Safety Advisory Committee. 
uh, that we have been uh, steadily working with since uh, the inception of this series. Uh, these folks have, again, just proved to be an invaluable assistance and provide a tremendous resource to us as uh, we develop these programs. And always to remind you in the field that we don't develop the stuff in a vacuum. We get a lot of feedback from folks, and the advisory committee have been there from the get-go and continue to give us uh, a lot of very solid information, things that we can build programs uh, from. So many, many thanks to the folks that have served on that committee. Let me introduce our panel for today. Uh, our, our facilitator for the program will be Art Inouye. Uh, you remember Art from our last broadcast. Art is uh, presently a safety and management consultant and also a retired supervising probation officer from the Eastern District of California. Chris Sutton. Chris is a supervising probation officer from the Central District of California. Art Penny. Art is a supervising pretrial services officer from the District of New Jersey. And as promised, Rhonda Forsythe Mosel. Rhonda is a the, uh, budget analyst currently with the uh, Federal Probation Office in the District of Nebraska. And in addition to that credential, Rhonda uh, has served as a first uh, as faculty for first line safety for the Federal Judicial Center. Uh, she's taught in the state uh, probation system and taught on the topic of safety, and also serves as faculty uh, for their district uh, safety academy in Nebraska. So. In addition to the uh, safety and training credentials of our other panelists, uh, we wanted to emphasize that Rhonda brings that to the table as well as her experience from the admin side. So welcome to our panelists. And at this point, Art Inouye, it's all yours. Thanks, Mark. Today we move to the office setting, a place many believe to be a relatively safe place. We're going to examine that assumption and look at various parts of it because it is a, a action-packed series that we have to present to you today. So let's not waste any time. Procedurally, here's how we'll go. We'll go to each Push to Talk site after the video. Push to Talk sites will give you a heads up in the order in which we're going to present four questions to each site. We, we uh, encourage the, uh, the sites that uh, aren't uh, on air at that moment to jump in with, uh, with matters they feel it should be aired and their, their observations of, of the video or some d expanding on discussions that, that were uh, being made at that point. And then we'll, we'll move uh, from the push to talk side to the panel, and the panel will do the same, and that is we'll have a lead person, and then the other panelists will, will enter into that. Uh, and that's the procedure. Uh, so uh, without further ado, because this is an issue-packed series, uh, I, uh, I promise you, here's where we'll go. We'll, uh, let's start, uh, let's, let's roll the first video. And from there, uh, we'll move on. We'll answer the questions in the following order. District of Maryland, the District of New Mexico, Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and the District of Arizona. Yeah, well, I know you need it today. You only told me about 6,000 times, but I can't. Tomorrow is the best I can do. Take it or leave it. Yeah, I'm hanging out with the feds again, so what? <laughs> yeah, you're telling me. If I took care of Watson, that'd solve a lot of my problems. A nice chokehold. Just kidding, ma'am. Everybody? I'd never hurt Mr. Watson, he's a friend of mine. <laughs> Look, you wanna get somebody else? Be my guest. I don't need this crap from you right now. No. What don't you understand Suzanne, about tomorrow? could you come up and relieve me for a while? It's past time for my break. Thanks. I've already missed appointments. Mike, you're due to see Eric Slattery, right? Yeah, he's here, and he said something I thought you'd want to know about. So, Mr. Slattery, how's it going? Well, if you want me to be honest, it ain't going too good. Have a seat. So, how come we're in here instead of your office? Sometimes we interview here. Is there a problem? It's because of what I said out front, right? About getting rid of you? Frankly, yes. You said something that was understood as a threat. I said it was a joke. So you got an armed bodyguard out there? We don't need to go into that. You can just assume we're in a position to deal with any physical threats. 
So if I threaten to leave this place and go to work, is he going to shoot me? Nobody needs to shoot anybody, Mr. Slattery. But you do need to sit down. You know, I'd like to get you out of here without wasting time, but we've got several things to discuss. Fine. Discuss away. I'm concerned about these missed appointments. You were scheduled to meet last month on the 3rd, but you didn't make it. So we rescheduled for last Tuesday, but you didn't make it then either. You didn't call either time to say you weren't coming. We're getting way behind on your reports. Oh, we are, are we? Well, I got news for you, Watson. I'm fed up with this report crap. I'm just trying to live my life here. But every time I turn around, you're bugging me about some damn thing. Some damn report. Or I got to come to your office for something. And you've been following me, nosing around my wife and asking stuff that's none of your damn business. I've just about had enough. I went to your house because that's one of the conditions of your supervision. I explained that to you when we first met, remember? Now I can understand you feeling supervision is intrusive. Intrusive? It's choking the life out of me. I know you're not happy, but want to sit down and tell me more? Let's figure out what to do about this. I had a job today that somebody else is doing because I'm stuck in here. So my soon-to-be ex-wife is pissed because I'm not bringing home enough money. So she makes up all kinds of garbage and you lap it up without even getting my side of the story. I'd really like to get your side of the story now, Mr. Slattery. I do need you to sit down, though. I'm not raising my voice. I'm being respectful. I need you to respect me, too, okay? You said you're missing out on a job, but this is the first I've heard about it. Can you go and do the job after you leave here? No, I cussed the guy out. I don't think I'm going to be going back there anytime soon. Are you still taking your meds? None of your business, asshole. What do I got to do to get you out of my face? Look, we can't have this conversation in this way. I need you to come back out to the waiting room with me, and then you can talk to a supervisor. Pretty tense, isn't it? Let's go to the District of Maryland, Debbie Wojciechowski, and push the talk group in the District of Maryland. Uh, the safety issues would be that the threat, uh, the the, the threat should be taken seriously, uh, the possible dangerous behavior of the offender, and the escalating behavior of the offender. Should be taken seriously. Debbie, your group, uh, having said that, uh, the other push-to-talk groups, what do you think about uh, what goes into that uh, uh, in terms of taking it seriously? What should be done? Let's get the uh, District of Arizona first. Lori Trigilio from the District of Arizona and her push-to-talk group. It did appear that things were done right off the bat. Uh, the receptionist identified that there was a problem with the offender, and in a manner that didn't alert the offender, she told the officer so that he was able to take the offender into an office that didn't have items on the desk um, and that type of thing, and possibly also to let people around the area know to keep an ear out for what may happen. Jim Muth, thank you, Lori, from the District of Arizona. Jim Muth, uh, the District of Pennsylvania, with regard to what were the safety issues in this case? All right, uh, obviously there was a, a, a threat made that was overheard by the receptionist, and, and we believe that the receptionist did the right thing and uh, notified the officer right away. Um, the one thing that we felt that really should have perhaps occurred uh, and taken place was a phone call to uh, either the FBI or one of the other authorities to come up and deal with the individual before you brought him back to the office. Excellent observation, uh, an important uh, uh, option. Um, let me turn to the panel now and, and ask uh, uh, Art Penny to lead us into the discussion from the panel. I think these guys have hit a lot of you know, key points, Art. They've, they've touched on a lot of things uh, that we should have done or should have been done beforehand. Um, one of the things is precautions. What precautions can you take before letting this individual into the office? Um, we used a special room. Were there any special features in there that would enhance the safety of the officer? Um, it was great having no objects on there and so on and so forth, but it didn't look like there were any uh, special things in there that would make him safer than not using his own office. Uh, a backup. 
you know, at that point, somebody should have been alerted and let them know that this guy is highly agitated. He, he, you know, he said some things in the, in the lobby. I'd like you to stand outside the room and listen to what's going on. And thirdly, his positioning should have been a little bit better giving him access out of the room as opposed to the offender. When the offender was standing, he clearly could have blocked that door and there wouldn't have been any way out. So precautionary things, I think, are real important um, when dealing with these types of issues. I would um, be concerned of the other offender that's in the waiting room. Um, I would have liked to seen that offender removed first before the um, uh, officer removed the one who was posing the threat. So perhaps if his officer came and said, I need to see you because he was in the midst of this and I believe we have a responsibility to this person's um, welfare also. The administrative person played a significant role in this scenario, so I'll ask uh, Rhonda to give us her perspective. Well, I think that, it, as this scenario shows, um, administrative staff and support staff are actually the first line of defense for an office, and the administrative staff person, was were, she was actually the eyes and ears of that officer, and by notifying him, she, she kept that office safe. So what we have here is uh, an, uh, an alert uh, s staff member who knew what to do, was trained at it. There was a procedure in place. A an officer who, who may uh, could have positioned himself better uh, and dealt with it did, and used some verbal techniques to uh, try to uh, take care of that situation. There were other matters that could have been taken, um, uh, taken care of by uh, other means as, as identified by the push to talk groups. Definitely many more things that could be said about this in establishing uh, this kind of high-risk circumstance and office circumstance more for you to consider. Let's move on, though, and go on to the next, uh, next uh, scenario, uh, next question. Uh, let's find out what, what did the officer do well? And for that, I want to go to uh, uh, Tammy uh, Yerkeson in the, the District of New Mexico and uh, push the talk group there. Tammy from the District of New Mexico. Uh, we identified several things that the officer did well, including taking the offender to a neutral room, acknowledging the threat but not focusing on it, using a calming voice when talking to him, and excellent voice commands uh, by telling the offender to sit down, uh, just uh, regularly uh, using his voice commands. Uh, I want to uh, move the question then to uh, Rhonda uh, with regard to uh, what the officer did well. Well, I thought the officer did a very good job of asking questions and trying to bring that offender back into a thinking behavior. Um, he remained very calm and not non-threatening to that offender. He had open palms and it seemed like maybe he knew that offender enough to let him vent and and go on about his situation, but he, the officer seemed to be very helpful. I would have liked to see the officer, uh, well, well I should say, I liked the way the officer said, I'm respecting you and in turn I would like to have the respect back from you. Um, I thought that was a nice, uh, strong comment to make and potentially um, settle the person down a bit. I think one of the things he did is he didn't escalate it any further. Um, raising your voice, becoming loud or argumentative with him when the offender was raising his voice, you know what that can do in a situation. It can highly escalate something. So I thought he did a good job with, with that. Good verbal skills. Absolutely. Uh, he used some techniques he, he obviously was trained to do um, and could use some safety training with regard to positioning, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the next question then, the, uh, the natural next question, uh, I'll, I'll go to the uh, District of uh, Pennsylvania uh, and and ask the question, uh, what could the officer have done differently? Um, uh, Jim Muth and the push to talk group there. Yes, Art. Um, well, as we said before, we feel that uh, perhaps the uh, police or the FBI should have been called in ahead of time. Um, as far as bringing the individual back to a, a secured office, um, we felt that was a good idea. However, we didn't like his positioning in the office, especially a few times when the offender had stood up in a threatening way and the officer remained seated. Um, we didn't really agree with that. We thought that was uh, lacking in safety. 
uh, as well as we, we didn't feel he had good control over the conversation. Uh, he was trying to keep a low-key conversation going. However, um, it seemed to be getting out of hand. Let's move then uh, to the panel. Uh, I'd like to go uh, first to Rhonda because I want to talk about, in this instance, the receptionist, Rhonda. And if there are any uh, uh, administrative people in the Push to Talk groups, uh, I'd like them to comment with regard to the receptionist role here and how that receptionist performed in this circumstance. Well, once again, as I said before, Art, um, the support staff is really the first line of defense for the office. They're the first person who meets and greets that offender or defendant. And how they react to that makes a big difference in keeping that office safe. Um, the receptionist was very good. She was alert. And even though there was a window between her and the reception area, she remained alert to what was going on. And I, and I think that that's one of the things with our offices that do have the safety windows and glass. Um, we, need to, we need to be real cognizant of what's going on out in that waiting area and not become real complacent and not pay attention because we are the eyes and ears of that of that office. Um, she didn't challenge the offender at all when the offender was making threats. She just kind of acknowledged it and, and went ahead and called a support staff person. There was obviously a procedure in place. Called a support staff person and moved into another office to warn that officer of the threat. Okay, let me include the panel uh, in, in a combined response to what the officer did and then to the receptionist question as well. I invite your comments regarding both. I, I agree with um, the sites that the, the officer needed to stand up. The um, offender stood up three times and the officer didn't stand up to the last. So I would have liked to see him at least stand up in the second one. Um, do you have to bring this person back? If somebody has a threat, can you structure them outside that in the waiting room, if you clear the waiting room, that uh, this is not going to be acceptable and you will come back tomorrow or something of that nature? I mean, are we bringing our problem back to us? Or, I mean, this is just one option. Um, w the seating arrangement also bothered me, as was mentioned. And I think this officer was very, very task-oriented. He, he was just th uh, threatened again by the profanity, et, et cetera, and then he continued to ask, um, we haven't reported, da, 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 so the tunnel vision was taking place. What about the receptionist? Receptionist did an extraordinary job, I think, because she was um, calm and she didn't instantaneously react and call. She let it sit, settle down for a minute and then she made that call. So in this situation, she should be commended. You know, watching this scenario, I had a difficult time sitting in my chair and not wanting to stand up here. So I can't imagine in a real life scenario that I'd be sitting there that calmly. However, there is one thing to keep in mind. If you rise, again, depending on the size of the officer and the defendant, you know, a six foot three officer could be a very intimidating force. And that may be enough in itself to resolve or, or calm him down. On the other hand, it could also entice him. So just, you know, I'm not saying that we want to remain seated. I agree that it it's puts us in a defenseless situation. But be prepared for what may occur when you do rise. The other thing that stood out with me is one of the things Chris said also was the fact that he had an opportunity to go out into the waiting room and assess the situation. And that's the whole opportunity. That, you know, you have him right out there. You knew something was wrong before you even got him in, and he didn't take advantage of that. And then thirdly, you know, we, he used a couple of charged up words like, we're ready to deal with any threats. You know, that's something to, to maybe get him going a little bit even more. So I, I don't know that I would have said something along those lines. I guess my concern along those lines would be, did he put the receptionist in danger? Because he indicated to the f offender that he had been told about those threats. Mm -hmm. Another consideration. Let's go to the push to talk sites. Uh, Lori in Arizona, uh, you have an administrative person there? This is Renee from the District of Arizona. Hi, Renee. What are your What are your observations? As far as what the receptionist did, I think she did very well. As the panel has noted, she remained calm. She didn't cause everyone else in the lobby to become upset or to feel threatened. Rather, waited until she could get away from her phone and alert the officer as to what was going. 
Great, thank you. Are, are you finished? You got cut off there. Okay, we'll go to Jim Muth. No, that's all, thanks. <laughs> okay. We'll go to Jim Muth uh, in Pennsylvania. Okay, Art, I have Edna Rich from our office. Um, I think the receptionist did an excellent job, but I think uh, since the officer came out and you don't know if um, he contacted anybody else and let them know that there was a potential problem with the defendant, she could have contacted the duty supervisor just to make sure uh, that officer was safe. Good observation. Uh, in Maryland, Debbie Wojciechowski, you have an administrative person there with some observations about the receptionist's uh, part in this? Yes, we do. Um, our John Toomey. Hi, how you doing? This is John Toomey from Baltimore. And the thing that I uh, noticed was the receptionist, although she did a great job, she did let the, the offender know that she was calling somebody because he said, you did call somebody on me, didn't you? And I think she could have done that a little bit, you know, better as far as notifying him that she was calling somebody and reporting him. I think that she put the other gentleman in the waiting room in danger at that time. Thanks, everyone. The focus here is on the receptionist and the role that uh, the administrative staff plays can be an important one. And, and procedures and roles to be played uh, should be clear in your offices, and that's what we end with here. Uh, on, on the the question of uh, lessons learned, uh, what lessons can we learn from this? Let's go to the District of Arizona uh, to lead us into this discussion. This is Lori from Arizona. Um, as we've been stating, I think primary lesson is the importance, as you stated, the first line of defense, the receptionist, and she is the eyes and ears, and to be trained as to do the things that this receptionist did, to listen to stuff, to be calm, anything that is a threat, to advise the officer and possibly other officers around to kind of keep an eye on, on the officer and the offender when they're meeting. Another one would be that a neutral office is often a good, a good thing to do, but maybe to use them more frequently so it isn't an unusual circumstance. The uh, offender wouldn't be put on alert that something's different. By using a neutral office, you, can, you don't have your family's pictures showing. You don't have your stapler, your uh, pen sitting out. Another one was the importance of making sure that all staff has been trained in verbal judo or de-escalating situations. Another point I think that Chris Sutton made is officers too often are task-oriented, and when somebody is getting so upset, you just need to cut it off and say, I'm not going to put up with this. You're going to have to leave until you can calm down or call me tomorrow morning. And we don't have to finish what we were intending to do that day. Again, I think the, the last point we'll make is the positioning of the officer where he was sitting. It was in a very vulnerable position with the offender angry and over him. He was blocked. He could not get to the door. So again, I think it's anticipating what could happen, where do you want the offender to sit, where do you want to sit, and I guess that wraps up what some of the issues and lessons that we, we received from this scenario. Very complete, Arizona. Thank you very much. Uh, walk and talk technique, uh, I think, is one thing the officer could have used. Let's move to the panel with a, a question about the lessons learned in this scenario. Uh, Art, can you I think, I think Lori's right on target. You know, the main thing to realize about this is that it's not a one-man job. The safety isn't responsible. It doesn't fall onto the safety person or one person in the office. It's everybody's responsibility. It goes from the receptionist to the support staff to the officers to the administrative to the chief. Everybody has to take an active role in, in you know, protecting the officers and staff within the office. Um, also realize that you know, this, this was a very obvious scenario where the behavior was very clear that he was angry and, and made a threat. It's not always going to be that clear. It's not always going to be that obvious. So it's important that we provide all staff, especially though the receptionist and the clerical staff, the administrative staff, administrative staff, um, in this type of training, so that they can pick up on it first. And again, that could be a real important step in in not letting something escalate. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that trust your instincts. If it doesn't appear right, if it doesn't seem right to you, guess what? It's 
probably not. So if you sense something, if you feel something's not right, stop it where it is and, and move on and get it another day. And lastly, if there's an outburst and something goes wrong, you've calmed it down and now you think you can re-engage him in conversation, you're probably wrong because you're going to go somewhere that's going to agitate him again and then we're right back to square one again and maybe even worse. So nip it in the butt and stop it. All right, I um, would emphasize too that in this situation, in any situation, the old adage, expect the unexpected, mm -hmm. is, is underlying in everything. And furthermore, take this situation outside of the um, office setting and in the future when any home calls are made, it should be done in pairs on this particular individual. I also think that it would be a good idea to alert the other individuals in the office, especially admin staff, of this individual and his behavior and threats. So when this offender comes into the office again, that admin staff person is going to be aware that there's a potential problem with this individual. Um, I, you make a good point that we include admin and support staff in our training and in our policies and procedures. And we also need to remember when we bring new staff on to also train them and, and update them on what the policies and procedures are. Obviously, you can move on with more and more questions with regard to each of the issues here. You can talk all day. We encourage you to do that. Let's move on to the next scenario. We're gonna, what we're going to do is uh, ratchet it up a notch. and uh, So let's roll the video. We'll answer the questions in the following order. The District of New Mexico, Eastern Pennsylvania, District of Arizona, and finally the District of Maryland. So, Lily, you've been out of the hospital two weeks now. How are things going? Uh, okay, I guess. You guess? Well, Mom's been having some of her headaches. That always makes things a little bit harder. But I'm hanging in there. <clears throat> It'll be fine. She's feeling a little bit better already. Good. Um, can I ask you a question? If I'm okay for a while, could I go back to seeing Mary Brandt? Well, Lily, the way we look at it, once you've had severe mental health problems, it's a good idea to see a mental health specialist for a while. But if some time passes and there's no reoccurrences, we can talk about reassignment, sure. It's just she kind of understood what was going on with me. I understand that you and Ms. Brandt had a good rapport. But for now, you should consider me your probation officer. If there are things I need to understand, just talk to me, okay? Yeah. So how's the job going? It's okay. Anything new there? No, not really. How about the GED? Any progress there? Not yet. I've been just working and helping Mom pretty much all the time when I'm home. <clears throat> I'll have more time when she gets to feeling a little bit better. I think a GED would make a big difference in your life. I know Ms. Brandt thought so, too. Okay, Lily, I have a note here to ask you about your DUI cases. What's going on with them? I really don't know. Um, I figured somebody would tell me when to go to court, but they haven't yet. That's odd. Should have at least had a date scheduled by now. Why don't we call and find out? Okay. Hi, Josie. This is Larry Simons at Federal Probation. I have Lily Gladstone in my office. She has two pending DUI cases. I'm trying to find out what's going on with them. Yeah, the uh, first case is uh, 012487. Sure, I'll hold. You OK? Want some water? Yeah. Oh, really? Hmm. Look, is there anyone there I can talk to, help her figure out what her options are? Okay, thanks. Did you know you have two bench warrants out for your arrest? No. I didn't know anything about it. Okay, Lily, just, uh, just have a seat and we'll figure out what to do about this. Okay, now the clerk's office said that you missed two court appearances on April 2nd and April 18th. Do you remember getting any notices about that? No, I didn't get any notices. April 18, though. I wasn't in the hospital then. You know that. You said so yourself. 
How can I go to court? Okay, we'll make sure they know that. This shouldn't be too hard to clear up. She said I could find out more from the sheriff's office. You want me to call him now? Okay. Hi, Sergeant. This is Larry Simons at Federal Probation. I'm calling about Lily Gladstone. I understand you have a couple of warrants out on her. Well, she's in my office now. I'd like to help her get this cleared up. Can I put you on hold for a minute? Look, Lily, this isn't so bad. You just have to guarantee that you'll be in the sheriff's office tomorrow morning. Well, what if I can't do that? Then they'll send someone to arrest you now. Look, Lily, this is important. You need to make this a priority. I'll tell you what the priority is. My mother doesn't know anything about these DUIs. And when she figures out I've screwed up again, she's going to kill me. Doesn't anybody care about that? Of course, Lily. We all care. We can clear this up. It's not really such a big deal. Just sit down and we'll talk about it. No, I can't go back there. I can't go home. It'll never get any better. Never. I can't do this anymore. Ah! Lily, Lily, just oh, calm down. Can I help? Okay. Look, see if you can find Mary Brandt. Maybe she'll talk to her. Lily, do you want to talk to Mary? No! Look, just calm down. Hey, what's going on in here? No. This looks like it's getting out of hand. No. I'll go get the marshal. No! No! I can't go back there! And you you won't make me! I'm not trying to make you go back! Miss, you put no, that down right no. now! No! Well, after you've calmed down, uh, we'll move to the Push to Talk group in New Mexico. Mexico. What are the safety issues here? Well, we have uh, a lot that we're looking at here. We have an emotional person, and uh, knowing that uh, she she was a little bit concerned in the beginning, uh, maybe we should have continued to ask her about her feelings in the beginning uh, mm -hmm. with more questions before uh, confronting her about the warrants. Yes, and that's a significant <laughs> point at which you, though, you could have uh, 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 intervened. And what are your other observations with regard to this, uh, the, the issues involved here? The other issues uh, that we're looking at here is the office situation and keeping her calm and making sure she's not in an area where there's something that she could pick up as she did. Uh, she picked up something that became a weapon for her. Absolutely. What you have on your desk means something um, in, in the area around it. The other issues we are looking at is that she was not comfortable with her probation officer and maybe bringing in her previous probation officer to discuss matters may have calmed her a little bit uh, to talk about some of her emotional feelings before moving on to discussing the bench warrants could have eased the situation a little bit. Okay, thanks. Debbie, what was your host key? One of the safety issues would be having um, the PO prepare prior to um, meeting with the offender, particularly regarding the mental health issues and the pending warrants. Perhaps the, um, the call should have been made prior to the meeting if the warrants are, uh, were outstanding. And also there would have been a value of having the initial PO at the first meeting since that uh, PO was aware of the mental health issues and had worked with her. Thank you, Debbie. And New Mexico, thank you, too. Let's move to the panel and, and start uh, with Chris uh, in the panel discussion regarding this I, issue packed. I think both sides have really covered most of the issues, but I think um, there is one or a couple that haven't been that we haven't thought about. And have we ever been trained to identify potential suicide um, individuals, uh, suicidal individuals, and what are we um, supposed to respond to? in that particular situation when they exhibit these signs or symptoms in our office. And also, um, what, when this escalated, wh where are we on the color code of awareness, all right, and also on the um, use of force continuum? How would we resolve this? Would we use a, um, a you know, capstone or would we use defensive tactics? Um, so beside diffusing the escalating verbal situation that's going up, what are some of these other things 
that are potential um, s uh, resources to us to be used to bring the situation under control. I also think one of the major issues here is the other employees in the office and what happens when they become aware of an emergency situation, how they handle that, and when and if they're going to intervene, and what they should or shouldn't do. You know, with this art, there are so many signs that she presented. You know, her, her body language, her nonverbal cues were persistent throughout the entire video, and I'm wondering how much training in this video the individual had on, on recognizing those signs and symptoms. So I think that's real important to, to mention. It's also important to realize how, you know, what you need to know about your individual the history of the case, the events going on in her life. You know, she kept touching on her mother and, and issues going on with the mother, and he didn't really delve into that at all, about what's going on, why, are you, why do you have so much anxiety with your mother, so on and so forth. He was focused on the GED and on the bench warts and, and so on and so forth. So there were clearly issues that she was having difficult, difficulty with that he wasn't responding to. And lastly, what about the pocketbook? Did that cause anybody any concerns at all? You know, the way she was clinching on to that, and it was very large, and God only knows what could be inside of that. But, uh, you know, you have a lot of potential weapons that, are, that could be in there, and she had it so close to her. You know, how do you handle a situation like that? You know, is there a way to, to calmly, without bringing attention to it, get that away from her? Obviously, the spectrum of, of issues here brings us through uh, administrative procedures, it brings us to personnel, uh, skills uh, that you have when, when you are facing this sort of thing, use of uh, uh, various defensive uh, weapons such as capstan, understanding your indoors, all kinds of considerations that go into this. Uh, let, let's take a look uh, at what the officer did well. Uh, and for that uh, question, let's turn to Jim in Pennsylvania, his group, uh, push to talk group there. Jim? Yes, Art. Um, you know, the, the officer definitely had a difficult uh, uh, offender to deal with, and um, any one of us could have at, at, at some point in our careers have to deal with that type of a person. Um, the one thing I did uh, see that I thought was pretty good was he tried to remain as calm as possible. Uh, he tried to talk in a helpful and understanding way. Um, when, when the offender started acting out, you know, he, he positioned himself in, in as best a way he could. He stood up and uh, looked to be ready uh, for a possible attack against himself. And also, he, um, you know, he attempted to contact or have Ms. Brandt uh, contacted to, to possibly bring her in to help intervene. Excellent observations, Jim. Um, Let's move uh, from the push talk group to the panel and ask Rhonda to lead us off with that question. What, what did he do well? I think it was very friendly and very reassuring to um, Lily. He tried to ask questions, kind of bring her back into thinking about what was going on. Um, he left the door open um, so that others could hear. He, um, he was just very calm and very reassuring. You know, he also, he offered her a drink. He asked her if she was, you know, is everything okay? So he was trying to assess the situation. He could have gone a little bit further, but he did ask those types of questions. Um, he was also trying to be, you know, to be helpful for her in, in trying to resolve the warrants. I think he could have taken that one step further when he was on the phone with the courts. He had documents verifying where she was. He might have tried to resolve it right over the phone as opposed to, saying to her, you know, you're going to have to go down here tomorrow and otherwise they're going to arrest you today. So he could have taken it one step further. He also saw that the, um, the uh, button he was pushing regarded her mother. And um, I think if he would have delved a little more into the mother, how she, what's your mother's situation, stuff like that, it would have been more helpful. Good observations. And so the logical question that arises is, what could the officer have done differently? And for that, Let's turn to Lori Tregilio in Arizona and her Push to Talk group. Hi, this is Eric Olson from the District of Arizona. Uh, some of the things we saw that uh, he could have done differently, one of the main things was um, kind of, he, he kept going past the uh, mental health issue and not dealing with it. He was uh, very task-oriented and uh, 
kind of just kept continuing to do that rather than listening to her concerns and, and delving into to her issues. Um, you know, perhaps on another day it would be a better day to deal with that, the, other, the other issues. Um, but uh, it, he definitely needed to deal more with the mental health. He, uh, you know, he, he said he was wanting to help her and, and, and work with her and stuff, but again, he wasn't listening to her. He could have brought in uh, her past probation officer uh, at an earlier time, which would have uh, probably um, not permitted the, the situation to escalate and uh, help the transition a little bit better. Um, she, he could have uh, instilled perhaps a little more hope uh, for her by, by, like I said, delving into uh, her mental health situations and, and just her anxiety with her mother and that type of stuff a little bit more. Interesting how we can just click off the things that we could do um, in, in the heat of battle. We forget that uh, there's, uh, there's not just the job to be done, but there's, uh, there's the immediate to deal with, and we should have the skills to do that. To the panel's discussion, let's turn to Art Penny to talk about the issue. What he did, what could, what could he have done better? One of the things, Art, is that um, he kept using some emotionally charged words, severe mental health problems. Um, he said not a big deal several times. You know, to him, it's probably not a big deal because he realizes how this is going to be resolved. To her, though, she's hearing arrests, she's hearing warrants, you know, she knows what's going on with her mother. So for her, it was a big deal, and, and we don't want to, you know, talk to her in that sense. We want to try and, and keep her calm, not agitate her even more. Um, the other thing that stands out with me is, you know, pretrial services, for example, is at a big disadvantage. We get cases sometimes an hour later after they've appeared in court, and now we're dealing with an individual like this for the first time. So the more information you can gather about an individual, the more, you know, sources that we have where we can pull their history from is greatly enhance your, your safety. There's a lot of valuable information that explains her behavior, things you should be aware of, and so on and so forth. And then the other concern that I have is with an OD. How many times do we bring an individual like this into our office who we've never dealt with before? You know, our mental health specialist is on vacation, and now you're dealing with an individual who you're seeing for the first time. You're not really aware of what, you know, the problems are. It's important to review the past month or so of what's been going on with her. Uh, maybe the officer who's handling it might have some areas in the top of the, of the crons that would highlight what some of her issues are. Maybe some of her normal behavior, if there is such a thing, you know, things that she may display which are not threatening but typical to her behavior would be a good cue for the officer who's now, you know, looking at this case for the first time. Art, I would have liked to have seen her, or the officer, um, call the hospital and get records from the hospital um, that would, because she just recently was released. I would have liked to have seen him pay more attention to her um, uh, nonverbal signs, the twirling of her hair, pushing her back her hair, the hyperventilating, which he did momentarily, and then he glanced down and looked at the case number or whatever, and I think that played a more important part uh, to prevent the situation from escalating as highly. Okay, so what lessons can we learn from this situation? For that, let's turn to Debbie Wojciechowski in the District of Maryland. Debbie? Thanks, Art. Um, some of the uh, points that have been brought up or have already been discussed, however, I have gotten some excellent feedback from the group here today in Maryland. Uh, one would be that the personal safety is the primary goal at this time. The second would be that the phone call regarding the outstanding warrant should have been made prior to the meeting. Uh, next, the PO should have listened better. I know this was already mentioned, however, it did not appear uh, to several people in our group today that the PO was really listening at all to her what she was saying or to her body language. Also, another excellent point that was raised is that when the PO put the sheriff on hold, he could have taken it off hold as a safety factor so that the sheriff could have listened to the situation that was occurring in the office. And finally, um, a better plan should have been in place in the office. It didn't seem like there was a plan in place or the two officers that came in to help didn't really know what to do. Excellent. Uh observations, uh, a couple of which the panel was really impressed with. So let's go for the panel's impressions and, and have Chris lead us into the discussion about lessons learned. Well, I agree with Debbie that um, he didn't have a plan, but he didn't have a plan B or C. Um, 
things escalated and he needed different plans. This lady was in a crisis situation, and when anyone is in a crisis situation, let it be ourselves or an offender, uh, their behavior is not what we normally know of them. So he was not expecting the unexpected. We always need to expect the unexpected. Uh, if it's a mental health case or if it's a case that we don't feel is, is a, a, um, a high risk issue. Um, also, what is our responsibility to assist somebody that's attempting suicide in front of us in our office and then all of a sudden the tables turn and there is a potential risk to ourselves as well as to a third party, the individuals that were coming through the door. Um, what do we need to do? Um, I think we would all want to try and assist this offender, but we also have to put ourselves in a position of safety and then think of the third person involved also. And again, I think this raises a, a significant training issue. We all need to have this type of training. Um, support staff, administrative staff, and officer staff need this in case these situations do come up to this level that we saw in this lady. I do think that had there been a code word in place um, indicating an emergency or that something was wrong, the officer could have turned to either one of those individuals, said that code word, and they would have been aware that something was actually going on. This was an emergency situation. Once the officer jumped up from his desk, I'm assuming there was probably a panic button, um, distress alarm on that desk. He was away from that resource of hitting that panic button and getting help. Push to talk sites. Uh, Rhonda uh, 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 made an observation regarding the third parties here. Uh, what are your observations regarding them? Important question. Uh, anybody? This is Lori in Arizona. Hi, Lori. It did seem that the people that came into the room also escalated it, at least the gentleman, the second gentleman, and had he been trained and possibly coming in maybe in a calm way, can I help? Um, also, I, I do agree with Rhonda, having a duress button, something available, or a word possibly that the, the officer may tell to the other officer to let him know that this is escalating, maybe you could get some backup. Good, good observations. Uh, preparation, um, uh, verbal skills, um, uh, ability to focus on the real issues in front of you, and to uh, uh, consider matters regarding legal and ethical considerations regarding your responsibilities, your obligations, are matters that uh, we'll, uh, you're going to discuss later, I'm sure, because they, they're issue-packed all the way through. But we have to, uh, we have to move on, and, uh, and uh, then uh, to the next one, we're going to move it up one more time. This is an unusual, admittedly, an unusual circumstance. But it's full of a couple of important questions that we'd like to, to examine here. So let's roll the tape. The districts uh, will uh, address the issue in this order. Eastern Pennsylvania, District of Arizona, District of Maryland, and the District of New Mexico. Hi, Mr. Farrell. Come on back. Hey, Ms. Johnson. How you doing? I'm fine. Are you okay? You look a little wobbly. Oh, I had the flu. I'm still spaced out. I, I would have got here sooner, but I couldn't get out of bed. Not for three months, I hope. Has it been that long? Yes, it has. Okay. The last I saw of you was in early May when I saw you at your mother's house. Since then, I couldn't find you. Yeah, well, things got kind of confused when I had to move out of Mom's. You knew about that, right? Yeah, your aunt told me that your mom was incarcerated. I'm sorry to hear that. Thanks. So where have you been all this time? Oh, here and there. Mostly at Angie's, though, now. Angie? Is that someone new? Yeah, well, I've known her for a long time, but we just sort of got together now. And what's Angie's address? It's, what is it, 282 West Summers something or other. Is that an apartment? Yeah, it's a uh, 54B, I think. Mr. Farrell, I tried to track you down, 
but no one knew where you were, so I had no other choice but to get a violation warrant. I'm gonna have to call the marshals to come in and arrest you. I knew that before I came in. My aunt told me. I really hope you can help me with that, Miss Johnson. Because if I go back to prison, they'll kill me for sure. You know that. They almost killed me last time. I can't just let you back out there so you can disappear again. But maybe we have some other options. Looking at you now, it looks like there's a lot more wrong with you than just the flu. Have you been taking drugs again? Oh, God, Miss Johnson, don't even ask. Yeah, that's what I thought. Why don't you tell me about it? Well, I keep trying and trying to quit that shit, but I don't know. I just keep on. What would you think about some inpatient drug treatment? I think I sure could use it, but I don't know. What about the warrant? Well, I'm going to have to let the marshals know that you're here, but we may be able to work out something so that you can get to that treatment facility. I think that'd be really good. Why don't I give the treatment provider a call now? Uh, before you call, um, I've got to go to the men's room. I don't feel so good. Oh, sure, I'll walk out with you. The restroom is right around the corner. Angie, what are you doing here? Oh, I just thought I'd come down and have a few beers with the P.O.s. I came to get you. To take you home, Selma told me you were here. Yeah, well, thanks, but I don't think Miss Johnson here is gonna just let me leave. She was about to call someone to have me arrested. Oh, big surprise! Why'd you come down here when you knew they had a warrant out? That was just dumb, Wayne. Let's just calm but down. But the longer I wait, the more trouble I'm in. Yeah, they would have had to find you first. You were doing just fine. Look, we're not gonna talk about this in the hall. Mr. Farrell, go ahead and go to the restaurant. You can't put him in prison because of all that garbage with the old gang! Are you trying to get him killed? Wayne, why do you trust her? Nobody even said he's going to prison. <laughs> yeah, I've heard P.O.'s lies before. You're not going to get him killed. Not now. That's not okay. Wayne, run! Get away from him, you bitch! Get off of him! Stop, Pharrell! Wayne, run! Before I go to Jim and his group in Pennsylvania, I invite the other Push to Talk groups to give us some input with regard to what you see and fill in some of the parts that uh, aren't being said uh, and and give us some of your observations, okay? So now let's go to Jim in Pennsylvania and the Push to Talk group there. Hi, Art. Um, wow, that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, there was a whole bunch of problems with that uh, scenario. Um, <laughs> let me start. Uh, first, there was uh, the fact that she brought in a fugitive uh, that could have been a little better coordinated by perhaps uh, having the marshals ready uh, ahead of time. Uh, second, there were safety issues. Um, you know, it was dangerous for herself uh, and, and at one point also the defendant. Um, her positioning, uh, the location of the interview, and the lack of communication with other agencies and officers uh, should have been brought up. Um, and there was also just a flat-out lack of control uh, of the situation. It was a lack of control. Uh, there are other observations. Uh, I'd like the other uh, Push to Talk group uh, to give us their, their thoughts. This is Lori from Fien or Arizona. Hi, Lori. That's, what are the your thoughts? The stairwell really was a dangerous position. Um, to place herself in. I, that can go into many things, her falling, uh, being isolated, um, just a myriad of, of different safety problems. Having conducted uh, many safety academies in Arizona, you can, uh, you can point out a lot of the issues here. Um, any other push to talk groups? Thanks, Lori. Art, how are you? This is Leonard Casales of the District of New Mexico. Leonard, how are you? Good to hear your uh, voice. What we observed here was, uh, again, like the other districts mentioned, uh, they're chased into the, the hallway. Uh, you're looking at a trap situation. Basically, the officer was assaulted by a third party. Um, there was no call out for help, no call out for backup. There was an individual that came down the hallway, it looked like it was an office member, that turned around and went. We're assuming 
they left to uh, uh, obtain some help. <laughs> We're hoping that happened. Um, the officer continued to escalate and get into a situation that put her at risk, not really, you know, helping anybody, but putting her at risk. And that's one thing we don't want to do. Excellent. Absent any comments from the other person talk group, um, we'll move to the panel. Uh, yes, um, oh, good. Thanks. This is Debbie, and I'm Baltimore, and one of the officers here just brought up a very good point um, concerning a safety issue that the PO, uh, should she have really been interviewing the offender when the offender appeared to be intoxicated? Good point. You're just asking for trouble when you do that, aren't you? Um, any other push to talk observations? Okay, let's let's move to the panel uh, and and examine as closely as we can what the officer did right. And with that, uh, I want to turn to Rhonda. I think one of the big issues here was the layout of the office space, and the very fact that this officer had to leave a secure area to take that offender to the restroom. Um, possibly, she could have um, alerted someone else, taken another officer. Um, I think she was very good about remaining calm, but maybe too calm in the whole situation. And what are your observations? Did she have to bring him back to her office? Could she have called? Um, I would have liked to have seen the receptionist, when the receptionist called her, Rhonda, say so-and-so is here, then she called the marshals. If, if they're in close proximity, okay, and then um, once that they arrived, uh, put them, bring them to her office or whatever. Um, especially that was mentioned when he was unstable on his feet. Why, why bring him back? Just keep him maybe in that waiting room at this point. And once the conversation got going, um, his mindset was something else. She had a mindset, he had a mindset. And so we're having a clashing <laughs> right at this point. As far as what she did well, I think these guys covered most of it. Uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot here um, that could be noted that was done well, other than the fact she did get down the stairs with no problems. Uh, so she was probably in good shape. But other than that, you know, there's a lot of issues on the other spectrum of what she could do differently in, in handling that situation. My hunch here is that, that uh, this person is a good counselor and uh, is in the helping mode. But this isn't the helping mode circumstance, and for, our, for us all, we need to consider uh, what the circumstance is and have uh, a, an approach for each, because in this circumstance, there was nothing we're going to do to help anyone, and that uh, defensive mode would probably have been a, a good, uh, good way to go. Um, it's, it's a volatile circumstance, and so um, we, we are real interested, though, in, in one other aspect of this, and I want to turn to Rhonda for this. Uh, what about the third party, the, the person in the hall? Um, what about them? It looked almost like the officer went into tunnel vision as soon as the situation changed and a third party came in and the girlfriend was there. I don't believe she recognized that there was someone behind her. Um, she kind of focused in on the girlfriend and kind of lost sight of the whole picture. At this point, if, if it would have been a probation or pretrial employee, she could have, and there was a code word in place, she could have said that code word to indicate that, that there was an emergency situation. Also, this is an, another area where she had to go outside that secure area. Had she been in the probation or pretrial office, she this situation would not have occurred because the girlfriend probably would not have gotten back into the office with him. Let's go to the District of Maryland and push the talk group in the District of Maryland. What could the officer have done differently? The four main issues that we have decided the officer could have done differently. First of all, again, some of these have already been mentioned, and I apologize for that. Um, the warrant should not have been served in the matter, should not have been addressed in that manner at all. Um, that was out of place. The um, officer should have not have taken the offender from a secured area to an unsecured area. And the question that was raised here in Maryland, Art, is um, we were a little bit concerned what the secured area wa exactly was, how 
um, for example, how the girlfriend was able to get into that area, it didn't seem like there was um, any security measures whatsoever in place. Uh, another good point was that a plan should have been in place and a male officer should have been escorting the offender to the restroom, particularly um, if there was a weapon that the offender was perhaps um, hiding in the restroom. And last, again, we mentioned this earlier, um, the officers wanted to know how the girlfriend, the third party, was able to enter the area. Real good questions uh, for, for us to answer. Uh, anything else from the Push to Talk group? Yes, Art, this is uh, Jim from uh, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Um, we just feel that, you know, there should have been a plan, and, and she should have utilized the plan. Um, it appeared to us that, you know, she brought this individual back who was wanted and uh, was going to talk to him. Uh, meanwhile, it appeared that no one else in the office was notified. Uh, there were no, uh, uh, no signs that the marshals had been called ahead of time. And we feel that all of those steps should have been taken care of prior to the individual even coming into our office. And certainly, um, when you have a wanted individual, you're not going to uh, allow the person to go to the bathroom at that point, um, at least not unescorted by uh, a male officer. Good observations. Um, let's move uh, from uh, the push to talk sites and, and go to uh, the panel and let Chris uh, lead us into the question of what this officer could have done differently. Well, she certainly, the officer didn't expect the um, unexpected in this one. She thought she knew this offender, and I would have liked to seen her um, distance herself. She was way too close to this offender. Um, walking down the hall, they look like a couple. I mean, she needed to spread out. Once the third party came up, I would have liked to seen her back even further away so that she has that triangular effect being able to see both of these and I don't think the um, girlfriend would have been able to push her. Also, what about a cell phone? We all are gadget oriented now. We all have our cell phones. Uh, if her cell phone was on her um, person, she could have backed away, continued to back away, never turn her back to these two people and call for help um, if she couldn't get back to the office. Um, I think we've all agreed here in the panel as the sites have also we wouldn't be running down chasing someone downstairs especially when all of a sudden um, the person um, we have a person in front of us and the person that shoved us is to our back also um, why couldn't she just let him go and uh, telephone the local police or the marshals and have him picked up at the bottom those are the things that really seem very troublesome here. I think she got caught up in the emotion of the time and didn't think this through and didn't have a plan. And I guess, did she comply with what her district's policy or procedure was for when somebody comes in and reports with a warrant? Those are the things that I think could have been done a little bit different. You know, the one thing that I question, though, isn't it our role as law enforcement officers we have somebody with an active warrant here. Um, we have not contacted the marshals yet, but we know that there is an active warrant for her, and we have somebody trying to flee. Isn't it our responsibility as law enforcement officers to subdue that defendant and bring him back into custody? I think it is our responsibility, Art, to some extent, as long as it's done in a safe mode and there was no safety factors in place here. Um, she allowed him to go to the restroom. It would have been nice if she had was working with you and could ask you to go in to the restroom and make sure he, he was okay um, and then come back out um, and have the marshals there. But do we chase people? And if we chase them, uh, what are we prepared to do once we catch them? One of the things that really bothered me in this one is what if there was, um, he's running, he had his plan, the girlfriend had her plan, and they grabbed the officer or they grabbed somebody out at the bottom of the stairwell and took him hostage because he was adamant he was not going to go uh, to prison. He was worried about his welfare. Um, apparently he had been threatened by some gang group before. So he knew what he was going to do. I'm sure there were sub-districts who were 
kind of raising her hand, wanting to ask if uh, <laughs> they can pursue. That's not my stance, but I, I, I just wanted to generate that because I wanted to hear what kind of response we have. I guess there might be a certain situation where you might want to uh, pursue, but I think typically that's not our role. That's what the marshals are paid for. That's not what we're paid for. If you know an individual is possibly a threat to either himself, like the scenario from the last one where the woman was possibly going to attempt suicide, or a threat to someone else, then maybe that might change a little bit in, in, in your thought of pursuing somebody. But again, that, I don't think that's our role as probation and pretrial officers. You're in a public place, uh, and if you elect to take, uh, use force, you have to consider the, the, the other people around and the risk you put them in, in, in doing that sort of thing. So it, there are all kinds of considerations here to be made. I also think that once the situation changed, she wasn't expecting the unexpected. Um, when she walked out in the hallway, the situation changed completely. She had a girlfriend in front of her that was very confrontive, um, obviously wanted her boyfriend out of the role of the, the probation officer, didn't want him to go back to jail. And then she also had that third party that came in also, well, actually the fourth party, either the employee or whatever. Um, that situation changed, and I think we have to look at those mindsets and make sure that we're prepared if the situation changes in a flash like it did here and not be surprised at those elements. She also touched him. Okay, it was a nice gesture trying to guide him, but I don't think we're in the position where we should be touching people other than shaking their hands and, and I think this could have escalated the situation a little bit more with the girlfriend. The girlfriend was very possessive of him. I think sometimes Art too that officers believe that they can handle any situation and that you know I have a good rapport with my defendant and you know I can kind of predict what he's going to do but I think you know the unexpected but you, you can't predict anybody's behavior. First of all you haven't seen this guy in three months you have no idea what's been going on for the past three months. He just got done admitting to you that he's been using drugs. And they have somebody under the influence who, you know, typically are not rational individuals, are not a thinking person when they're under the influence. So you're, you're not going to be able to predict their behavior. So I think for her to make that assumption was a, was a big mistake on her part. And many of us watching this can just delineate all of the things that we believe and know to be right. One of the things that uh, I want to emphasize is that we can have an academic understanding of what, what things have to be done, but unless we condition ourselves uh, to develop a mindset that will work when we're in a high-risk uh, situation, when, in a tense, when it becomes tense, when, when things have to happen automatically, that's when w the conditioning that we, we've done for ourselves works. And in this circumstance, it's a perfect example that that uh, the person should have, well, there were a lot of things they could have done before that, but once in that circumstance could have reacted. Uh, and and we, we often talk about uh, connecting the mind to the feet and uh, have the feet work so that it gets you out of trouble. And that's, that's just one technique. Uh, and many that, you, that you, the subject matter experts in your, your districts uh, can teach you. But it's a matter of your commitment to it and, and taking personal safety seriously and not as an academic exercise. Uh, Ron, did you have some comments? Well, I was just going to say we do become so task oriented. This offender had not been in the office. He also, she knew that there were warrants out. She knew once she let him go that he was out of the office. The marshals couldn't come in and arrest him and she became very focused on that. When do we let go and when do we turn around and just say, okay, this is it. Um, turn around and go back and call the marshals or hit the panic button? Good questions. Uh, th those questions uh, are, are matters for us to uh, examine uh, later on in our individual groups. But let's go, let's go to lessons learned with, uh, to Tammy in New Mexico and her group in New Mexico and ask about what lessons can be learned from this scenario. Art, this is Leonard Casals with the District of New Mexico again. Uh, I think what we just saw was a culmination of the last two scenarios. And what the entire uh, nation should learn is that we've got to look at training. We've got to look at teamwork. We've got to not make the mistakes that were made in this third scenario. We need to work together. We need to look outside the box, not just with pretrial and probation, but you also talk to the marshal service, your court security personnel. When they see you out there with three other individuals, that they're aware that something might happen also. 
uh, comes down to training. It comes down to doing what we do in our safety academies, is getting, our, uh, getting each individual, each probation officer, clerk, clerk, everybody prepared for this type of scenario. Let's not let what we just saw happen in real life. Right on the money, Leonard. Uh, the important observation uh, with regard to lessons learned. Uh, let's turn to the panel now for lessons learned, and, and for that I'll uh, turn to Rhonda first. Well, and I think one of the lessons learned is does your district have a policy when you're arresting someone in the office? Does the policy state that there, you will call law enforcement beforehand, the marshals, the police, whoever, whoever's going to arrest that individual, and do you let other people know? if an arrest is going to be taken place. Also, what is, do you have a policy regarding um, chasing after a fleeing offender? Um, if, if not, maybe that may be something we can examine and, and take into consideration what are you going to do and practice that and mentally rehearse that so we know if a situation like this comes up, we will know. Um, also, if you, you do need to take someone outside of the security area, you need to be in the mindset that anything can happen. You need to expect the unexpected. And, and that mindset, you not only need to know what your own mindset is, um, the, uh, you need to consider the officer, the offender's mindset as well as that third party that came up. So now you've got all kinds of uh, different individuals in the mix rather than just the two. I think one thing that stands out is pay attention to nonverbal cues. You know, uh, again, he indicated he had to go to the bathroom. Well, did he know that, he, you know, he had done this before and that he would be going out into a, an area that was not secure when he went into the bathroom with nobody with him? You know, is it possible he did have a weapon, was going to try and get himself out of that situation? So pay attention to those type of things. And I think one of the most important things out of all these lessons is nothing is more important than your own safety. You know subduing that individual is not more important than you going home that night. You know, you, you know, you may have put yourself in a very dangerous situation by going down those stairs or going into that hallway um, and trying, I understand that you're trying to achieve, you know, a, a task there, you know, you have a warrant, you're trying to make sure that warrant is executed, but it's not more important than your safety. And I think that goes in, in with all these scenarios that we just went over. We've uh, gone through just three circumstances but they were issue-packed, weren't they? Uh, a verbal threat, uh, what's that mean? There are so many considerations here for you to consider and for you to talk further and develop ideas with regard to, to what procedures should be in place, what kind of training do we need. Um, a suicide situation, where do we go with that? I mean, how many people know what to do in that circumstance? Third parties? and your, your administrative staff. There's a role in each of these circumstances for everyone, and that role should be one well, everyone be well aware of and training attached to that so that everyone can act in concert. Um, and when you come into a, a circumstance like this last one, uh, your physical setting means everything, and maybe if you have to escort someone into a public setting, you need to reconsider uh, whether that's a, a safe uh, kind of thing to do. And you should have uh, develop some practices uh, that, that make it safer. Um, equip yourself with, with the kind of uh, safety techniques that allow you to respond in a, in a circumstance of this nature and to understand what your role is in a fleeing uh, offender or defendant uh, circumstance. Uh, be clear on that and, and have concluded it ahead of time procedurally and by policy in your district to understand what your limitations are, what your obligations are. And these are things for you to discuss as a group. And we've just touched the tip of the iceberg in each of these circumstances, haven't we? We suggest that each of you uh, do that. And, and for the panel, I, I want to thank, thank you for your uh, participation and uh, turn this over to Mark. Thanks a lot, Art. Appreciate the discussion. Thanks to our Push to Talk sites. Um, as has been pointed out today, uh, many of the points covered by our Push to Talk sites in answering the questions, the panel discussion, um, it truly has touched the tip of the iceberg, as Art has said, about uh, many of the safety issues associated with each of these scenarios. And as I said before, these scenarios are based on actual events. I'm not going to offer to you that we re actually recreated verbatim. Uh, we do the best to research talk to the people involved, 
and depict them as close as possible uh, to what actually happened. But again, based on actual events that occurred in the field. You still have unanswered questions. You still have things that hopefully uh, each of you will go to the what if mindset and, uh, and entertain at your own site and continue the dialogue. In, in the scenario with Lily, our, our, our uh, mentally uh, uh, disturbed individual, uh, at one point during that scenario, she picked up a plaque and went after a third party. What do you physically do at that point? You know, do you tackle her? Do you go after her? Do you spray her if you've got caps done? Uh, those should be some of the questions, again, that folks should be, should be talking about. Um, this last scenario with the girlfriend, suppose you, you, know, you have the policy, you decided you're not going to chase this guy down the, down the stairwell. Uh, what do you do about her? She's just assaulted you in the hallway. Do you just back away, make note of it, go back to the office and, and recoup? Or how do you deal with her if you're left in that situation? Again, the what ifs. Um, with the fleeing individual as well, it was brought out in discussion yesterday during our rehearsal. Um, sure, the policy generally is not to flee. Uh, nothing is worth your personal safety, as Art Penny has, has said. Um, but what if you have knowledge? What if you have a, a direct concern or, or are aware that that individual, either the fleeing individual, intends to hurt themselves or intends to flee because they intend to go out and hurt someone else? Again, the what if scenarios. Carry these out uh, to, to other options and other concern, other areas and, and discuss amongst yourselves uh, what are some of the other things that could have happened. Uh, even though they weren't necessarily depicted in the, in the scenarios that you saw. As you continue, uh, hopefully, what, and one of the things we've learned since we've started this series is that sites are going back and using the scenarios, using these videos, and other trainings that are doing uh, in-house. And um, understanding that when some of the districts are doing that, some people who are charged with facilitating those discussions may not be totally comfortable in that role, uh, may feel a little bit like a duck out of water. We want, at the center, want to offer you the opportunity, if you'd like to call upon one of us to assist you in facilitating those discussions in your district, we'll be happy to do that via an audio conference with you. And uh, again, feel free, if that's something that you think you'd like to have, uh, just uh, as an extra voice to help get the discussion going, or someone to play devil's advocate, so to speak, uh, give us a call. Uh, you can call Bill Timish, and his number is in the FJTN Bulletin uh, uh, under the listing for this program and give him a call at the center and we can set that up for you. So again, uh, we'd, be, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, as always, we thank our panelists, we thank our sites, and we thank all of you who took the time out of your busy schedules to watch today's broadcast. And uh, until the next time we get together, let's keep the dialogue going, okay? Take care. <laughs>